Hi, I'm Tony Fair. I came to the IMA at the request, the invitation of Lisa Fryman, Senior Curator of Contemporary Art, who asked me to uh, make a work for the, as an inaugural piece for the Ephraimson Family Entry Pavilion, and uh, which I was quite honored and thrilled and surprised by, but, you know, and uh, came out there and uh, studied the space and uh, through the process of how I work by um, not so much a site-specific but as Bob Irwin says site-determined work. Um, notice some interesting curiosities about the architecture of the space. The fact that it's an oval with a square of columns set in the center but they're twisted so that it all, and you enter from the side angle, so nothing looks square, nothing looks round, and, and I thought, well, this is an interesting peculiarity that I can probably take advantage of. It's called Tin Spot Buddy, which is new to the collection here, and again, I'm very uh, honored that uh, Lisa acquired it from, for the collection, came out of my last show uh, at Pace Wildenstein Gallery in New York. And it is a, um, a piece that somehow originally is inspired by you know, alcoholics and alcoholism, honestly, because I, I work largely with found objects that are not so much Duchampian in nature, it's simply those things that happen to be close by and accessible. And in my wanderings through Lower Manhattan, there were different places where you would find piles of these small pint and half pint bottles, the kind that homeless men and men in, in sad situations buy, drink, and then toss it down. And so there would be these piles. I was very intrigued by that, so I started to collect those flask type bottles. And by just with the number of them and collecting and seeing what you could do with them, I came upon this idea that by putting them in a linear context, which is about this chain, and the way you hook them on, they actually start to spiral up the chain. So from something that was kind of an emotional response to an object that is found in our society, I was able to glean formal information from it and make a, a work that employs both those formal qualities and still has a kind of a, almost a romantic sentimentality. Because I, what happened was it started to spiral up the chain and I thought that was a very beautiful gesture. But I didn't want it to be a complete thing because it's just, it seemed forced. And the way that it hangs slightly above your eye, you look up at it and it suddenly became almost a revelatory gesture of looking. And I put a red marble in, the cor in, the, in each jar, which rolls down to the corner. So there's this other little red gesture, and I don't know, there's something, it just, it, it, it gives your eye something to focus on. It's also, I kept the same liquid in the jar, so it is vodka. And uh, I thought, you know, that was, I soaked the label off, but I just kept that liquid in. A lot of times what I work with is a bottle or a jar that is empty, and then I refill it with something of my own, a sort of water that I dye, or uh, marbles, or sand, or uh, some other thing. But I've gotten very interested recently of just keeping the same fluid that's in the bottle, in it. So this is, in fact, vodka. And what happens, the water or a liquid in the bottle um, heightens the optic quality, optical quality, and it makes it more of a like a lens. So when you're looking at this, and as I say, you follow the chain, you look up, and you're kind of like, oh, this spiritual revelation, and it 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 catches the light that's in the room. Well, I had to resist not drinking him, so I guess that I don't know if that's humorous or just kind of pathetic, but. Um, you know, the, the funny part was discovering the bottle in the first place and having the kind of the emotion of seeing these bottles in the context of how they are 
and realizing that they are coming from alcoholic men who basically live on the street or in a depraved and deprived situation of being a, you know, an old Bowery bum and uh, not wanting to exploit that or make fun of anybody, but really understanding that it's something that's there. And, but taking it out of that context, you wash it up a little bit, glass is sparkly and crystally and shiny and bright and I don't know it's almost becomes a beacon of hope which is not to say that I wouldn't like a vodka tonic right now I, you know I've described what I do and uh, as a you know a, the greatest cliche is it's an ongoing journey and I, I've made a career of stumbling blindly through life and uh, somehow collecting the debris and the disasters of my experiences into something that has an aesthetic and emotional resonance. For me, I wouldn't do it if it didn't work that way. And obviously for somebody else, because you know, as an artist, you, you make art for yourself, but ho you hope that somebody else is going to respond. And I'm very touched that people have. You know, I don't know that you can hope for that, I, 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 honestly. I, d I believe that art has a transformative possibility. And it's not that art is going to change the world, but I think it can affect people. And, and take you to a more positive place. Um, Richard Serra once said that uh, art doesn't change the world, and his example was Guernica, Pablo Picasso's Guernica. He said it didn't stop any bombs from dropping on anybody's head. He painted that in the relative comfort of a cold water flat in Paris while the war was going on. He chose to make a painting that nobody saw for 20 years while other people chose to fight and die and drive ambulances and and I thought that was a very a very powerful statement in the same way that uh, Goya catastrophes of war very highly well published it didn't do anything so I think as an artist you have to be careful that you're not see it setting out to change the world I think you're lucky if you can provide something that people take into themselves and are moved. And that's what people have told me, and I find it very humbling, the, the fact that some bum like me could create something out of my own necessity, from my own selfish need, that someone comes to me and says, you really, you affected me, you, you, something happened. And I, to me, that's the greatest gift. Probably the new location where I've had to move. It was said once that I, mine was a tent, was tenement art because it, it, it came out of my uh, cramped quarters down on the Lower East Side. And the whole Lower East Side was my palette. And this is something that I discovered over a period of time. Also, uh, when I finally, the echo of my mother's voice in my head, clean up your room, clean up your room. When that finally faded away and I just, stopped and there was a sort of a debris that began to grow around me. I'm like, oh, wait a minute, this is, a, this is interesting fodder. And I started using things that were immediate to me. And then I realized that there was all this possibility on the street. Well, the Lower East Side has changed. It's clean now. There's no stuff. And rents went up and I got moved out. So I'm in a very different location. I've had to reinvent how I live in New York City. I'm in the South Bronx. I have a huge loft, which I never thought I would have before. Some people are suggesting that I was going to start making big work. In fact, the work got small again. It's almost like when I go inside this loft, it's so big, I feel like I'm outside, but I'm in a private outside world inside. And instead of trying to fill it up, I'm a little intimidated by it. It's, it's not, somebody, it's not intimidating, it's just the scale, it's, it's, it's a place to come back down. I never go to movies. I don't like the experience of going with the crowd. And, uh, I think the last movie I saw was uh, Jackass. 
and I got busted by a friend, middle of the day. He said, what are you doing out walking around? I mean, then this is years ago, right? He said, what are you doing walking around? I said, oh, I don't know. Okay. You're going to a movie, aren't you? I said, yeah. He said, you're going to Jackass. Hot, stupid guys running around in their underpants. I mean, what could be wrong, you know? It's... You know, I, I'd be dead. It's just... I was supposed to be a naval aviator or a rancher in Texas or an oil man or a banker. It's supposed to, you know, at least have one wife, if not four down the road with lots of children. Uh, and somewhere along the line, I realized that that model didn't fit. And I didn't go to art school. I, I took four art classes from first grade to the end of high school. But one day I realized, you know what? You're an artist. It's a, it's a way of thinking. But I think that's the confusing part. Art is not about talent, it's about a necessity. And I woke up one day and I said, you're not gonna work in a bank, you certainly are not joining the Navy, and you're an artist. You may be a bad artist, but that's what you are. Why would I be emperor, king, you know? What would I be otherwise? I don't know, nothing. be a politician because I haven't answered one of your questions. Uh, 